This video is going to review cardiovascular system medications and we're going to talk about drugs that affect clotting. Now a healthy person is able to prevent continuous bleeding by forming clots, but clots can become dangerous and they can block blood flow, causing tremendous damage to our bodies. A thrombus is a clot in a vessel. A thrombus can block blood supply in the heart and it can cause a myocardial infarction or heart attack. A thrombus can form in an artery in the brain and cause a CVA or a stroke. A thrombus can form in a vein and cause a thromboembolism or a deep vein thrombosis. Clots can cause damage wherever they lodge. An embolus is a clot that breaks loose and it travels. A pulmonary embolism is an embolus in the lungs and this can be a life-threatening event. Because of the devastation blood clots can cause, anticoagulant medications can be used. Anticoagulant medications may be prescribed to reduce the risk for stroke or heart attack or prevent clots after heart surgery. They can prevent DVT or deep vein thrombosis. These drugs can also be used to prevent clots with patients who are on bed rest for a long time or with patients with heart dysrhythmias like atrial fibrillation. These drugs are often called blood thinners, but they don't actually thin the blood. What these medications do is they decrease clot formation, they can increase clotting time, or they can prevent clots from getting bigger. Because of this action, anticoagulants are not given to individuals with history of bleeding or bleeding ulcers, those who are having surgery or have delivered a baby in the last 24 hours. Coagulation is an amazing, crazy, complex process that stops bleeding. This diagram is a simple representation of the clotting process or the clotting cascade. I wanted to quickly review it with you so that you would have an idea where these anticoagulation medications work. Now, when you get hurt, there's an injured blood vessel. The blood vessel now constricts. Blood cells called platelets that are in the blood, they go to the area and they make a plug at the injury site to stop the bleeding. Now, a whole chain of reactions are initiated that are caused by enzymes called clotting factors. Most of these clotting factors are made in the liver. These factors activate thrombin, which then causes fibrinogen to change to fibrin. Now, fibrin, it acts like a glue that holds the platelet plug together. The threads that fibrin make, they trap the red blood cells to make a clot. In time, the red blood cell will dry out and form a clot, or form a scab. Now, anticoagulant drugs, these interfere in the coagulation process in different ways, and there are three categories of anticoagulant medications. There are platelet inhibitors, like aspirin, thrombin inhibitors, like heparin, and clotting factor inhibitors like warfarin, brand name Coumadin. Now before we give an anticoagulant, we need to get a list of patient medications or supplements to make sure there's no counterindications. We should check the patient's heart rate and blood pressure prior to administration and get a baseline. Alteration and vital signs could indicate bleeding. Baseline coagulation labs should be done. Drug dosage and therapy with these medications are guided by coagulation laboratory values. Patients should all be, also be asked about a bleeding history or if they're pregnant. After administration of anticoagulants, patients must be frequently checked for signs of bleeding. Signs of bleeding may, may include back or abdominal pain, blood in the urine or stool or in the vomit. Vital signs need to be rechecked with vital signs and if the patient's bleeding, the blood pressure, it's going to drop and the heart rate will increase. Follow-up coagulation laboratory studies need to be drawn to determine that the correct dose is being given. We don't want to slow this clotting process down so much that the patient's at risk for hemorrhage. We should also monitor a patient's red blood count and platelet count, which would indicate bleeding. Patients on anticoagulants should be educated on the importance of regular follow-up and blood tests that measure blood clotting. They should also be educated about side effects and signs of bleeding. Because they can bruise and bleed more easily when they're on these medications, we usually recommend that they use a soft toothbrush and an electric shaver. 
and all their physicians and their dentists involved with their care should be informed that they're on anticoagulants. It's recommended that patients on anticoagulants wear a medical alert bracelet. Okay, thrombin inhibitors. These stop the action of thrombin, which we just discussed is involved with clot formation. Indirect thrombin inhibitors affect other substances, which then inhibit thrombin. Heparin is an indirect thrombin inhibitor and is administered IV or subcutaneous. During therapy, the lab value of the APTT or activated partial prom ah, thromboblastin time has to be monitored to keep the, this medication in therapeutic range and prevent clotting. Low molecular heparins like enaxaparin are given subcutaneous and are most often given after surgeries that have an increased risk for clotting like knee or hip surgeries. Does it make sense that bleeding is an adverse effect of these medications? Some patients develop allergic reactions to these drugs, so watch for anaphylaxis. Heparin can also cause thrombocytopenia or low platelets and hyperkalemia, which is high potassium. There's an antidote for heparin and it's protamine sulfate. You know, some resources say that there's no antidote for the low molecular heparins, but then there are other resources that state that protamine sulfate can indeed help neutralize these medications as well. And in the past, there's been no antidote for these newer direct thrombin inhibitors, but it looks like ADEX XA has just been approved as an antidote. The class of clotting factor synthesis inhibitors lower the production of clotting factors in the liver, especially the ones that are vitamin K dependent. When the amount of clotting factors are reduced, anticoagulation results. Warfarin or Coumadin is the most common medication in this class. It's critical that the INR blood test is monitored with Warfarin to determine the dose. Patients have to be able to get to the lab or arrangements must be made for home health nurses to come to the home for weekly INR blood draws. A normal INR is around one, and when patients are on warfarin, the therapeutic range is two to three. Vitamin K is the antidote for warfarin. So does it make sense that patients should avoid foods high in vitamin K when they're taking this medication? Foods high in vitamin K are mainly your leafy green vegetables or broccoli and cauliflower. Warfarin is teratogenic and pregnancy category X, so it should not be used during pregnancy. In addition, a lot of medications and supplements may interfere with warfarin, so it's important to check the patient's list of medications. Antiplatelet medications work differently by preventing platelets from clumping together to form clots. NSAIDs, including aspirin, prevent a chemical TXA, which stops platelets from being so sticky and clumping together. Aspirin is a great antiplatelet medication and has shown promise in increasing survival rate of heart attack victims if taken with initial symptoms, and also in preventing subsequent heart attacks if taken daily. Generally, 325 milligram is recommended for heart attack victims and the low dose aspirin, the 81 milligrams, is generally recommended prophylactically to prevent heart attacks. It's important to note that NSAIDs also work the same way as aspirin, but to a lesser degree. It's important to teach patients to read labels of OTC drugs to make sure that they don't contain additional aspirin or other NSAIDs. Some antiplatelets like Cobitagril or Plavix, these work a little differently by affecting different enzyme. Common side effects of antiplatelet medications are nausea and headache. To decrease nausea, patients can take these medications with food. Adverse effects, again, include bleeding and thrombocytopenia. Thrombolytic medications dissolve blood clots that, are already, that have already been formed. They're given IV by trained nurses and usually in the emergency room department or ca cardiac catheterization lab or intensive care. There's a narrow window when these medications can be used. The sooner these drugs are started, the better the outcome. If it's been longer than six hours since the symptoms have begun, tissue damage has already happened and these drugs can create more harm than good. 
Side effects include bleeding, fever, and hypotension. Bleeding in the brain can also happen, so patients need to be monitored for headaches and changes in level of consciousness. Now, sometimes medications are needed to improve the body's ability to clot instead of to decrease clotting. These medications are used to treat anemia, low blood iron levels, and for patients on chemotherapy. You know, with chemotherapy, these patients, they have lower blood levels due to bone marrow suppression. Epoetin stimulates red blood cell production and oprivacin, it stimulates platelets. Now, think when there are more blood cells created with these medications, the blood can get thicker and blood clots are more apt to be formed. So we have to monitor the patient's blood count before administration and assess vital signs. We need to teach patients to recognize and report any sign of a clot, like swelling in one of the extremities. Patients should be reminded to have their labs done as directed by their provider. Well, that completes our talk on anticoagulant medications. If you have any questions, bring them to class.